Well, thank you both so much for being with us today to uh, review what it means to be a genetic counselor and what that role is for women. Um, what is a genetic counselor? It's a good question. We get asked a lot. Um, we have medical training or graduate training in medical genetics and also in counseling mm -hmm. so that we can help individuals and families understand um, both risks for genetic conditions, um, but also a diagnosis. Um, so we help them um, understand that information. If they decide to do genetic testing, we help them go through that process mm -hmm. and just help them with resources and advocating for themselves. Um, who should see a genetic counselor? We have a lot of different genetic clinics at UCSD. The individuals that come to see us here usually are 35 and older. They might have a personal history of a genetic disorder, a family history of a genetic disorder. Um, sometimes there are personal or family histories of birth defects. Um, and so those are the, usually the main reasons why we see people here. Mm -hmm. In terms of planning for pregnancy, you see both patients that are planning to be pregnant as well as pregnant patients. Um, how, how do those visits usually go? Yeah, so sometimes we'll see someone um, before a pregnancy mm -hmm. and we'll take a pretty detailed personal and family history mm -hmm. to try to understand. And usually we're driven by the patient's questions. So what mm -hmm. kinds of questions do they have about how those histories might affect a future pregnancy? And if there's testing that's appropriate, we'll talk more about that and help them with that process as well. Mm -hmm. um, when someone's already pregnant, we're usually talking more specifically about um, tests that are available um, for certain risks during the pregnancy. Mm -hmm. um, however, most most pregnancies are healthy and normal, and we always want to focus on that. Um, so we're really talking about what options are available so people can make the choices that are right for them. And then um, taking a family history as well during those appointments just to make sure there's nothing else that we want to talk about. Is there anything that a patient should do to prepare for these visits um, to get the most out of them? It's helpful if they talk to their family about um, specific health concerns. Um, oftentimes, women will come in and say, you know, I think that grandma had some heart condition or I think my brother's um, daughter is a little delayed, but they don't have any specific diagnoses or concrete medical records. And so as much information as possible it is for them to gather is helpful for our appointment. Mm -hmm. It's also helpful for a couple to just start thinking about um, what kind of information they might want, um, what might be helpful for them, what might stress them out a little bit more. We certainly go into a lot of detail and help them flesh out um, those decisions during the genetic counseling appointment, but it might be helpful for them to just think about that before they come in. Who do you usually recommend come to the visit? Just the patient herself or... It's a personal decision, and of course it's influenced by schedules and things like that. So it's helpful if um, their partner can come with them, um, but it's definitely not necessary. Of course, if their partner can't make it, having those conversations beforehand about his family history is very helpful. Um, but otherwise, we are welcome anyone that they want to have in the room to have those conversations. So. So how do you take a family history for somebody? Yeah, so we draw a pedigree for every family we see. And basically that means we are making squares for every man, circles for every woman, and drawing out, um, sketching out the family. So we ask about previous children, we ask about siblings, we ask about parents. And we typically will shade in individuals that have um, conditions of concern, whether it's birth defects, learning problems, genetic disorders. Sometimes it might sound a little unusual why we want to know if somebody has a full brother or a half brother or if their cousin with autism is on mom's side or dad's side. Certain genetic disorders are passed more through a man or a woman so that affects the risk assessment that we provide them for their pregnancy. For, for a patient that does have a family history, how do you approach understanding that family history? So uh, we take a pretty detailed family history whenever we meet with a patient um, because that can influence risk assessment. Um, and then really it's driven a lot by the patient's questions. Mm -hmm. So sometimes if we have um, a family history of a condition that the patient is very familiar with, mm -hmm. they don't necessarily you know, have a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes they're interested in either testing or what other things they should do to prepare if their baby does have that particular condition. So we can help both if they're choosing to, choo uh, choosing to test or if they're just interested in kind of what to do um, to prepare for baby.
In the absence of a striking family history, we usually review the option of screening tests versus diagnostic tests. They both have pros and cons. A lot of our patients end up starting with screening tests, but other women don't want to um, risk false positives or negatives and prefer to go directly to diagnostic tests. So we sort of um, see what makes sense for them. In talking about screening versus diagnostic testing, what are the key ways that those two types of tests are typically done? Screening tests are usually done by a blood draw. So a blood draw from the woman's arm, it's non-invasive, um, pretty simple, pr just send to a basic laboratory. Diagnostic tests are invasive tests. Mm -hmm. um, the CVS test requires removing a small piece of the placenta through the cervix or through the abdomen. Mm -hmm. um, the amniocentesis involves putting in a needle into the abdomen, into the amniotic sac, and removing some liquid that's around the baby. So those are invasive procedures. What are the advantages of a screening test? Um, so screening tests are often non-invasive, um, so there isn't a risk to the pregnancy. Um, and they are often less expensive for patients who might have an out-of-pocket expense that's high with their insurance plan. Um, the downsides are that there are both false positives and false negatives with screening tests. Um, so we can be falsely reassuring or there can be a positive result that prompts us to offer additional testing. It can cause a lot of worry and, and anxiety, and oftentimes the baby is healthy in the end. Um, but the, the pros of diagnostic testing are that it's highly accurate, as accurate as we can get in a pregnancy. The downsides is that are that they are typically invasive and carry a small risk of pregnancy loss. For, you know, for, for a pregnant woman who comes to you wanting to know what things she should be testing, but you know, a negative family history, what do you recommend that she should be testing for? Generally, our patients are considering um, testing for certain conditions that can happen in any pregnancy. Mm -hmm. um, these conditions are caused by having extra copies of chromosomes or missing copies of chromosomes. Mm -hmm. And they're not usually related to a family history. They can happen sporadically in any pregnancy. Mm -hmm. um, however, our risk does get a little higher for some of these conditions as we get older. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why one of the reasons that we draw that line in the sand at 35. Mm -hmm. And for women who are over that line, we just want to make sure that they've gotten time to discuss all of their options and understand them very well before they choose whether they're doing no testing or whether they're doing one of the specific tests. So we have the California State Screening Program, which involves looking at some hormones and possibly an ultrasound mm -hmm. um, with a very good um, test. Um, however, a slightly higher risk of a false positive, as we call it. So mm -hmm. getting a positive result on that test is not a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. It just indicates an increased risk and wanting to discuss further options. And then we have the cell-free DNA test, mm -hmm. um, which is generally offered for women who are considered at increased risk, so either being over 35 or having other positive screen results. Um, and that really is looking for small pieces of chromosomes that are in your blood, mm -hmm. um, but some of them help to represent baby and help us see, is there an increased amount, so is there um, cause for thinking there might be an increased risk. And what, what is the, main, the increased risk, if, if there are abnormal chromosomes, what does that mean for the pregnancy? Mm -hmm. So the most common chromosome condition is Down syndrome, caused by an extra 21 chromosome. There are other, both more serious and less serious chromosome problems that we can see by these screening tests and diagnostic tests. Um, some of them are trisomy 18, trisomy 13, Turner syndrome. So when we have a suspicion that there might be one of these chromosome problems in a pregnancy, and if we are able to confirm it with diagnostic testing, then we have the opportunity opportunity to provide this information for the family. Um, some families are very eager to get this information because they would like to prepare um, to have a baby with special needs, um, to have a pediatrician set up, to talk to family, and just um, be ready to meet their baby at delivery um, with, with knowing the diagnosis already. Other families do choose to end the pregnancy when they confirm a genetic diagnosis. And some couples don't really know which of those two camps they fall in, and they just know that they're anxious and want more information as conclusively as possible. Once a genetic carrier status has been identified, how do you typically counsel the family as to how to share that information or if they should share that information with the rest of their family? 
Yeah, whenever we um, are talking to a patient about their results or about our risk assessment, mm -hmm. um, we definitely talk about who that might influence otherwise besides them in their family. Um, and we're generally encouraging of people to share information so that they can do with that what they choose. So it may be that their siblings aren't interested in getting genetic testing, but at least if you share that information, you've given them the opportunity to make their decision on their own. Um, whereas if you keep it to yourself, you know, don't know if they would have made a different decision. So we generally encourage families to share information about their health, about any genetic testing that they've had. And we can also facilitate that if it's helpful to the patient. So we can either have discussions with family members or provide them with information that they can then pass on. Now, I know um, the, the American Congress of Obstetrics and Gynecologists has now recommended that we routinely test all women for both cystic fibrosis as well as spinal muscular atrophy carrier status. When that comes out positive, we refer to a genetic counselor. How do you handle those um, visits? So those visits usually involve a family history to see if there is any other family history of people who are either affected with that condition, which usually there is not, um, or other people who are known carriers, um, discussing risks to family members to be a carrier. So often um, people's siblings are also maybe not aware of that possibility of being a carrier. Mm -hmm. But the focus is usually on um, a current pregnancy if the um, patient is pregnant. Mm -hmm. um, and because of how those conditions are inherited, usually the next step is actually having their partner tested. Mm -hmm. um, so for those sessions, it is very helpful if the partner is able to come along mm -hmm. um, so that we can have that conversation about that next step. Um, because really, the risk to the pregnancy is highly dependent on whether that person's partner is also a carrier. While we're all probably carriers of some conditions, we don't always tend to be carriers of the same conditions. What happens if the father of the baby does turn out to also be a carrier? Then there is an increased risk for um, the pregnancy to be affected with that condition. Mm -hmm. um, but there's this diagnostic testing that we could talk about if someone is interested in finding out for sure. Or we can just talk about what that condition looks like and the family can help prepare for that chance. Um, so they can maybe meet with specialists or just learn more and get connected. Mm -hmm. Is, is any of this testing mandatory in pregnancy? Absolutely not. So it's all optional. And sometimes couples will come and talk to us and we'll meet for 45 minutes, go through all the testing options, and they'll decide they don't want to do any testing at all. And that's perfectly fine. Our job is just to let them know the testing options, sort of the pros and cons, and see what makes sense for them and their family. So once testing is complete, how does a patient usually get the information about their testing? It depends on the test, but we typically start by calling you over the phone to discuss your results. Um, if they're more complicated, we welcome you to come back in and talk in more detail. Mm -hmm. um, however, it's really a conversation with your genetic counselor about why you were doing the test and kind of your clinical picture up until that point and then incorporating this test result into that picture mm -hmm. to give you the context of how this affects where you were before and where you are now. So is genetic counseling typically covered by insurance? Genetic counseling is typically covered by insurance. Genetic testing is a little bit more variable. We usually encourage that um, patients check with their specific insurance provider um, to inquire about their genetic testing benefits. I will say that if a woman is deemed high risk in her pregnancy, it's more likely to be covered, um, but there might be special authorizations that need to be obtained. There might be coinsurances, deductibles. Um, so it's difficult to know specifically without checking with your insurance. So th there seems to be increasing popularity th these days with people going online and ordering genetic tests through the mail. Um, you know, what do you see as any potential advantages or any downsides of, of this type of testing? Yeah, there's definitely pros and cons to a lot of those tests. Um, we definitely love that people are getting interested in their genetics and proactive. Um, carrier screening really is ideally done before a pregnancy so that you have that information and can do with it what you choose. So the fact that people are doing that test earlier is, is good, um, but it has some caveats to it. And so, you know, it might be less comprehensive than the testing we would recommend clinically. And so it's just helpful if you can talk to your provider about the testing that you've already had done mm -hmm. um, and if you have a lot of questions we can really help you work through what testing is most appropriate for you. 
Thank you both so much for your time and expertise in talking with us today. Uh, genetic counseling is a, is a critical part of providing the excellent care here at UC San Diego for healthy moms and healthy babies. So thank you both. It was our, our pleasure. pleasure.